Hi, everyone here and around the world in this poor and dear, challenging and changing earth. This week, the New York Times headlined, How Bad Is the Western Drought? Worst in 12 Centuries, Study Finds. The photo is the unrecognizable dry and cracked Great Salt Lake in Utah. The byline is Albuquerque, where we are also in serious drought. A climate scientist at the University of California, Los Angeles, A. Park Williams, Ph.D., used tree ring data to measure the drought. The result, the past two decades from the year 2000 to 2021, quote, is the driest 22-year period since 800 A.D., 1,200 years ago, close quote. Professor Williams said there have been several mega droughts in the past millennia that have lasted 30 years. And sadly, Dr. Williams says, quote, it is very, very likely that this drought in the American Southwest will go on for at least a quarter century, close quote. Another climate modeler at the University of California at Santa Barbara thinks the American Southwest will become drier and drier she says, quote, and that's primarily because of the warming of the land surface with some contribution of less and less rain. We are sort of at a shifting into basically unprecedented times relative to anything we've seen in the last several hundred years, close quote. Here's another disturbing headline from Wales in the UK, quote, Mystery as hundreds of dead birds fall from the sky onto the road, close quote. On last past Thursday evening, February 10th, a woman in the UK, Michaela Pritchard, was driving on a road between Waterston and Hazel Beach in the county of Pembrokeshire when she said in front of her, quote, it looked like there were hundreds of starling birds in the sky and all of a sudden, they just died and fell to the ground like a massacre, close quote. Another woman, Claire Eaton, photographed this dead starling describing so many starlings falling dead to the road as traumatic. She also said about an hour before her drive, she was at a nearby marina walking her dog when she saw a big flash of light that was unexplained. And another eyewitness was trucker Ian McCaffrey, who said he was driving that road when he heard, quote, a large electrical type bang and a load of birds landed on my car, close quote. Like Wales, only the week before on February 7th, 2022, in Mexico, another strange flock of bird deaths provoked the UK Guardian to headline, why did birds fall from the sky in Mexico? The location was a small town, 64 miles southwest of Chihuahua, Mexico, marked with a yellow circle on this map. Hundreds of yellow-headed blackbirds seemed to explode from the sky, dying as they fell, and the drama was recorded by a security camera on February 7th, 2022. Explanations for both of the sudden and strange bird deaths in Wales and Mexico in the week of February 7th to February 10th have ranged from the birds flocking in murmurations and losing their sense of direction and slamming into the ground, all the way to large birds of prey scaring the flocks into the ground. But what was the loud electrical bang in Wales at the time the birds fell there? Two weeks ago on the February 2nd Earth Files YouTube broadcast, I interviewed, interviewed gifted psychic Buddy Bolton in the Bronx, New York, after he remote viewed who, what is behind another Earth mystery that causes the loud window rattling, house shaking booms that continue to be reported in the United States and beyond. He sketched these two advanced U.S aerospace craft as traveling at hypersonic speeds and causing some of the mystery booms. Buddy also saw 
in 2024, two years from now, that there will be a powerful solar flare from our sun as it reaches solar maximum. He remote viewed that this will cause another Carrington-like event, that in 1859, 163 years ago, a huge solar flare from a coronal mass ejection from our sun collided with the Earth's magnetosphere and caused a magnetic storm on Earth so strong that sparks flew in telegraph offices, even causing fires to break out, and some people were hurt. And then, by 2036, in the next decade, Buddy remote viewed a micronova in which the entire sun releases tremendous energy that can actually scorch some of the Earth's surface and could be lethal to some plants, animals, and humans. Will advanced intelligences based on Earth help humanity? Buddy's remote viewing sees there are at least two extraterrestrial humanoid species that are actively helping us now in the secret space program and are trying to protect us from existential threats. These are the tall whites from 82G Eridani and the tall Nordics from several other solar systems, including the Pleiades, Sirius A and B, and Procyon A and B. In our local interstellar neighborhood, look how close the tall whites in 82G Eridani are to where the Nordics are in Sirius A and B on the left and Procyon A and B and where our red solar system of Earth and our sun is. The Pleiades are much further at 440.2 uh, light years from Earth, but there is a lot of co congestion of uh, what we would say would be inhabited solar systems in our neighborhood. Both the tall white and Nordic humanoid civilizations are considered friendly to Earth Homo sapien. And I asked Buddy if he would remote view both species as well as the threatening, highly technological tronoloid insect from Epsilon Eridani that is added with another blue arrow only 10 light years from our Earth. And this is the civilization described for President Ronald Reagan in a March 1981 intelligence briefing at Camp David. Tonight, we will concentrate on what Buddy's remote viewing showed him about the differences between the Nordics and the tall whites. And in an upcoming broadcast, we'll learn more about the Trontoloids on Epsilon Eridani. I thought there was a lot of overlap between the Nordics and the tall whites. And a lot of people were just mistaking one for the other. That was completely wrong. They are separate, physically very different from each other. The Nordics, they are six to seven and a half feet tall. They are staunchly neutral. They are referred to as the watchers. They're oftentimes mistaken as the tall whites because they're very pale skinned. 98% of them are blonde, light colored eyes, have emotions. They're more emotional than the tall whites. They're artistic. They're very pragmatic, self-preservationist. They're about themselves, but they'll break neutrality if they're extremely provoked. So these are one of the beings that are friendly to us that we don't want to shoot down their craft. If they're provoked, they will retaliate with viciousness and brutality. Would that be like the Vikings of the 8th to the 11th centuries in Europe? Sure, absolutely. I think philosophically, I just got the sense that the Nordics turn the other cheek I'm going to teach you a lesson. It's going to be brutal. You know, sometimes peacemakers are the most brutal war makers. So that's the kind of vibe I got with that. The Nordics are physically different in human proportions. Is they've got longer heads. Their heads are bigger. I think they have a larger brain. But the upshot of the whole longer heads is they're not as smart, loyal, moral, or technological, or stoic as the tall whites are, but they're much more athletic, 
much more militaristic. Would they be the blonde that met in Peru and Mexico in terms of Viracocha and other beings that have been described as light skin and blonde-haired there? I think so. Nordics had a lot of native interaction. The tall whites would be much more cautious about that kind of interaction. How did the Nordics become collaborators with the tall whites, and what are the tall whites like? Physically very similar. They interacted first through technology. Oftentimes, I think when different races and technologies are encroaching upon each other, they'll have electronic reach-outs, and that's how you can really tell the nature of the other technological species, is how they react to that first electronic reach-out. Which is the one that is most superior? Who would have reached out to who? The tall whites. The tall whites are incredibly smart, incredibly technological, very sophisticated technologies. They're very protective of it. They will not share any of the details. Some technology they don't want anyone else to use. They won't give it to the Nordics. The tall whites, the altruistic, stoic, impatient, exceedingly wise. They're also naturalists, bioprotectionists, and they're preemptive intercessionists. If there was a post-biological encroaching on an area that had a lot of biological life forms, they could morally find the justification to make some action to prevent that, even if it was a hostile action. The tall white technology is very daunting. Can you explain what the basic difference is in the technological advancement of the tall whites over the Nordics, and why would they have ended up being collaborators if the tall whites will not give the Nordics some of their technological know-how, that they're protective of it, and what their real relationship is to this planet? They both are protectionists to the planet to a certain degree, although the Nordics are more observational. The tall whites will do interactions that we are not aware of. The tall whites are much more technologically advanced. They have more advanced power systems, more advanced propulsion systems, multiple different ways to construct craft that the Nordics don't know. It's like having another race that is 500, 1,000 years more sophisticated in terms of technology. And why they would get along is goals and mutual enemies. There's a lot of different technological levels in the universe, and beings, especially biologicals, have to band together because there are other beings out there and non-biologicals that are a very big threat. So that's why they would come together. But why wouldn't the tall whites then share technology with the Nordics? The Nordics have a tendency to be very hostile. If they're attacked multiple times, they will retaliate brutally. The tall whites wouldn't want them to retaliate with their technology. And the tall whites are more altruistic. They'll turn the other cheek. If a child kicks me in the shin, a child can kick me in the shin a thousand times. I'm never going to punch the child back. Mm -hmm. That's a tall white. If a child kicked a Nordic in the shins 30 times, the Nordic would punch him. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So the Viking mentality kind of makes sense if you try and understand who the Nordics are. So the tall whites are much more sophisticated. And they will not encounter you if you eat other animals. Nothing that was alive, even plants. Tall whites do not eat anything that has ever been living. It's all engineered. The tall whites have three bases in the United States. They're all mountains. Most of their bases are in South America. They have a shared base in Russia with other races. Who is in the base in Russia? It's Nordics, the tall whites, and a kind of mantid, sort of small mantid. And where in Russia? All I got was a giant freshwater lake. They all share it. It's underwater Tall whites don't like to have underwater bases. They prefer everything in mountains. Being a shared region of interest to these three different groups, they acquiesced to the desire for it to be at that location. Well, there's supposed to be an Indian Springs in the West. I wonder how they came to do a treaty with the United States for a large underground housing the tall whites in the Indian Springs underground area. I had this calling to go to Indian Springs. 
And I went to Indian Springs. I sent you some pictures of the craft that I saw lifting up behind this series of mountains out of this kind of valley. And the craft was absolutely extraordinary. It was long and had a series of lights on it, white lights, and they would turn on. And it was very long. It seemed to be at least like five football fields. Wow. And that was a mountain area. I felt like it came out of the mountains. The tall whites are really intriguing to me. They are technologically so advanced, they can be immortal. But they choose as a race, they choose mortality. Why? I think that there are a lot of downsides to being a biological creature that is immortal. Biological creatures that are immortal could acquire incredible power. Then the new ones who were just born will be immortal. They would be at a tremendous disadvantage. So they choose mortality for so many different reasons. They can be over 700 years old. Well, do you think that the tube technology that was shown to Linda Porter by the praying mantis and the gray, it had tall, very white-skinned beings that had blonde hair, black hair, brown hair, white hair, some humans. Do you think that technology that some of the abductees call the resurrection technology would be used, maybe even created, by the tall whites for controlling the recycling of their souls? I haven't explored that. And it's a very big question on multiple levels. I got a distinct sensation that the longer the total distance, the more dangerous it is for them. So if they had to go from another galaxy, it would be far more dangerous than traveling from Ganymede. What is their relationship with Ganymede, the biggest moon in our solar system that orbits Jupiter? Are they there? Do they have a base there? Yeah, they have their own, strictly their base there. They have a population there. They need their own place that is just off of Earth. Here in this solar system, the tall whites have a base on Ganymede inside. It's even more than a base. It's kind of like a home. They have bases here. Each one is very purpose-oriented. But the Ganymede, there's a sense of relaxation and comfort. The home location, it's mostly exclusively the tall whites. Could you see in your remote viewing what the inside of Ganymede looks like where they are based? When I went on this viewing today, you get smell, sights, and sounds. You have kind of like almost being in a video game where you can go left or right. I didn't get into as much as I'd like to, but I spent so much time on it, and it was exhilarating. If you just look at basic astronomy, the reality of how many solar systems in every single galaxy, how many billions of solar systems per galaxy, how many billions of galaxies, it's preposterous to think that humans are the only ones. The universe is so built for life. Right. Every solar system has habitat and an energy source, and they now know that water is all across the universe. The universe is a rainforest. It's teeming with life. And you can only presume the most logical thing is that there's going to be beings that are more aligned with our nature and ones that are diametrically opposed to us. And so that briefing Reagan got, I don't doubt it. And your question about how come we're not told, we have been stunted as a species. If 50, 60, 70 years ago we were told the truth and we slowly got to acclimate and condition We've been stunted by not getting that information. I don't think we should be scared. It's kind of like, I live in the Bronx. There's good people and there's bad people in the Bronx. Yes, there's dangerous people, and I know not to do certain things in certain places at certain times and things like that. And I don't think people should be afraid of the future. I don't think people should be afraid of the different beings. I think we should just be respectful and responsible and know who to align with and not be hostile. Because there's a lot tougher, smarter people out there than us. This goes to the heart of why it is so important that you have remote viewed the tall whites and the Nordics, because everything that I've heard is those are the two big ones that are trying to protect this planet and humans on it. That leads to why can't this planet be told the entire truth that there is some consortium of planets who agree that the trinoloids should be stopped, pushed back, and that would give us some peace of mind, wouldn't it, that 
we may wake up to the presence of other life in the universe at exactly the time that the powers that be are worried about the trinoloids, but you have remote viewed and the tall whites are equal to or superior to the trinoloids. Yeah, I think they are. I think the tall whites specifically are superior in a lot of ways, but they're vastly outnumbered by the trinoloids the tall whites. They know the universe and its structure so much that they can kind of shift reality. And that shifting of reality, they can reshape environments. They can do all sorts of different, very powerful things. It's almost like our universe is on like a spin wheel and different aspects of our universe have different wheels inside of it. And the tall whites can kind of adjust that. Buddy Bolton has also remote viewed the Tronoloid insect civilization in the Epsilon Eridani solar system, which is about 10 light years from Earth. His sketches of the beings and some of their technology are fascinating, and in an upcoming Earth Files YouTube channel broadcast, I'm going to focus on the Tronoloids. But these advanced tall whites, Nordics, and Tronoloids have at least one technology that is in common if they are intergalactic, that is particle entanglement for instantaneous communication across light years. And like Jerry Wills in his Peru expedition that I have featured in one of my earlier Earth Files YouTube broadcasts, he passed right through a red rock door and experienced rushing through the cosmos to an all white structure in which a male voice told Jerry that our universe is an experiment created by that disembodied voice's dimension. Jerry never saw any beings, but he was shown a strange glittering dark mass inside long tubes that the voice identified as our experimental universe. And in Buddy's current remote viewing of the tall whites, Nordics, and Tronoloids, he has felt a primary intelligence that is not physical, but is operating through entangled particles from the Andromeda galaxy. People can understand that the distances in our universe are so massive that it's measured in light years, how long light travels in a year. Light is the fastest thing in the universe. 186,000 miles a second. Yes, it's faster than I can run. <laughs> <laughs> Why send out probes if you can't get the information back? And the primary intelligence is a non-physical life form in terms of physical biological bodies. And it's in another galaxy than Andromeda. So the primary intelligence, ETs, they entangle a whole bunch of particles all on the same tune. And then they give a bunch of these particles out to the different probes that are going out. Each one of these probes is supposed to go to a certain location and then build more probes and factories and things like that. And those have to go out with some of these entangled particles. But those particles can communicate instantly with the primary intelligence, ETs. And we know this is true in physics already with entanglement. When you entangle two particles and you separate them, tremendous distances, and you affect one or you just look at it to see which way it's spinning, it will instantly make the other one do something. And somehow the primary intelligence, ETs, figured out a way to take that ability to communicate faster than light. That is how they communicate. And only the larger ships and giant triangles also have these communication particles. They're very precious. And that's how they take the information they've learned from each of the solar systems and send it back to the primary intelligence, ETs. The primary intelligence that understands and works in frame code and with entangled particles versus what are the second generation life forms like and where are they? Second generation life forms are constructed like we create cars, essentially super advanced robots. Grays are created beings made for specific purposes. They are created by another more intelligent species for a mission. They are pre-programmed with the information they need. They can be created at a more mature physical level, and they can be of a whole wide variety of structures. They can alter different aspects of themselves. 
They can become aquatic if they needed to. In some lake in Russia, I remember them talking about seeing these giant swimming ETs. They had altered themselves so they could breathe underwater. Now, if you take an intelligence like us and you keep getting more and more intelligent, and you can see this in our society, we're slowly getting more and more digital. And at some point, it almost seems inevitable that our technology is going to become greater than our bodies and that some of these beings and species choose to go post-biological. Elon Musk said in a speech two years ago, for humans to remain relevant, they must become cyborgs. Well, it's going to go worse than that. We're not even going to have any biology left at one point because the biological parts of our bodies are a limitation. A post-biological civilization has gone through this kind of digital transition that we're in the middle of now. We're halfway there, you know. People wearing these glasses that have all the data and information on our planet, we're very much approaching cyborgs already. And then that just goes one step farther to post-biological as a species evolves more and more and more over time. And it was only five years ago that China beamed their first 911 pairs of entangled photons from Earth to a space satellite. So we humans on Earth now, too, are working our way to instant cosmic communications. And I have good news that we are so close to breaking through 199,000 subscribers. So I want to thank everyone everywhere on our planet Earth. And for those of you who haven't yet subscribed, just click on that red arrow. It doesn't cost you anything, but it helps the Earth Files channel at YouTube. And also, if you like the work that I'm doing here, please click on the like button. And Ian has let me know that Earth Files has been viewed in 77 different countries in the last four weeks and 116 countries in the past 12 months. Ian, tonight, where are our viewers from? Good evening, Linda. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Uh, just before we go into, um, into that, I just want to say that uh, I'm broadcasting here from the UK where we have another 72 hours of dramatic weather ahead of us. So this ties in with your unprecedented changes in the Earth yeah. mention that you had at the start of the program. And did We've you got, say uh, that you've got 100 miles in the UK at the moment with 70 mile an hour inland okay. winds? It's affecting almost all areas of the UK and 100 mile an hour gusts around the coast. We then have uh, Friday when Storm Eunice is going to impact the UK. And this is uh, reported as probably being the worst storm in 30 years. Wow. We've got flood alerts and we have uh, rail travel disruption. The reports on the BBC news are that travel should only be, be uh, attempted if absolutely necessary during these storms. It's like the uh, University of California Santa Barbara scientists said that we are now all the time in unprecedented events compared to uh, hundreds of years. That's right. We've got uh, this, this, these two storms of absolutely back to back. Anyway, we've got uh, viewers calling in today. They're from the, uh, including the Sonoran Desert and Kenya. And I believe that uh, we may have someone from the um, Micronesia Islands, the, uh, an archipelago in the Western Pacific. Well, great. Uh, and I'm very interested in people's comments and questions on this presentation tonight because I feel that I am opening up really um, valid content in terms of what I think is out there and that this is... Uh, Ian, we're, you're so loud that <laughs> you're moving papers. Anyway. I'm, I'm sorry about that, Linda. It's hard to hear as well because the wind is so, so loud Oh, here. my it's gosh. Loud. Well, we'll, we'll all struggle together. We're in, a, uh, in an earth that keeps changing rap rapidly. Uh, what have we got in terms of comments and questions on tonight's show? 
question in there. How tall are the tall whites? The tall whites, as I understand it, average uh, around eight feet tall, uh, a little taller than the six to seven foot or seven and a half. The tall uh, uh, Nordics are uh, in that area. A six foot Nordic would be considered short. They are seven feet to seven and a half feet. And the tall whites are taller than the Nordics at about eight. Linda, another question from Sexy Sadie. She says, uh, Linda, have you ever met Charles James Hall? Yes. And what do you think of his experience with the tall whites at Nantes yes. Air Force Base? Yes, I have talked with him at length. I have not a single question that he is telling the truth. And one of the more interesting uh, exchanges we had was he said that in, in a way, very similar to where Buddy said that the tall whites are very impatient. They, they're, uh, they're very, uh, they revere life, but they can be very impatient and they love their families. And that where he was in the area uh, across the road from Indian Springs on the uh, Area 51 air place where uh, Charles Hall was working as a, a weather person, he said that they had been warned that the tall whites would make very specific areas that would be where their children or their families would be and that no human was ever, ever to step over these boundaries. And it was all agreed upon. And he said one night, it was late, he was uh, on some sort of an assignment and he saw a a brand new person, a military person who was approaching the area where the tall whites are underground, but they would come up ab above ground and the children would play in certain areas. And all of this was known to Charles Hall and to others. And they were very careful about never ever stepping over the boundaries. And a new person walked right into it and a, 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 an adult tall white came up from underground and either killed or damaged the uh, new military recruit who stepped in by mind. He said they don't even need weapons. They can do it with their minds. But it was exactly the same as Buddy said, that when you understood how strict they are, but how profoundly brilliant they are and that they care about life and that they are they have a vested interest in trying to help us on planet earth that those would be what would be considered communication errors that the tall whites do not have any uh, animosity toward humans at all that they are overly protective of their territory where their families are and would be. And so between Charles Hall's own book and video testimony, I uh, watched a video, I think it went on for uh, two hours, of uh, Charles Hall talking about his experiences and his knowledge about the tall whites. It's, it's extensive. and. Buddy's remote viewing adds whole other, I think, layers uh, that show how our minds, like Buddy Bolton has this gift of remote viewing. Other men who have worked for the Defense Intelligence Agency and other agencies have th this ability to uh, resonate frequencies between the human mind and something out there. And in this case, I think that what Buddy has remote viewed about the tall whites in the Nordics reflects what I have heard from other people in military and aerospace and from Charles Hall. Linda, we've got people who are identifying with them, with the tall whites. They're saying that they've seen uh, the tall whites, they've experienced the tall whites uh, exactly as the image that you've used in your, uh, in your promo tonight. And are they saying anything about what 
they have learned or what the uh, end result of the experience is, which may well, not be well, right the, now. Uh, it says, give me their telephone number. Uh, another one, Pamela J, says she saw a tall white on top of a mountain in the forest area. She was not allowed to remember what the ship uh, she went into looked like. She said inside the craft, there were tiny glass tubes on the tables. And she said the tall whites I saw had black leather outfits and they had modern looking black hair. Uh, she says the ones she saw were around about seven feet tall. And she's promised to email us more details okay. as well. Did she know what the glass tubes were for? Were they, were they uh, well, we'll, we'll entangled particles? Uh, if you do, Ian, put it in the chat Ian, or, uh, or email us. Ian, ask her if they might have been for entangled particles. I, I'm sort of joking. Okay, well, well she's in the chat anyway. Uh, I guess this goes back to another tall whites question. Linda, were the tall whites the ancestors of Northern Europeans and were the Greek gods perhaps the first record of the tall whites? I don't know for sure. What I can say is we know that in terms of the uh, blonde Nordics, like the Vikings, that if their sources are these other solar systems in my interstellar neighbor uh, map that I am now showing and going to continue to show in when I can, then that Nordic genetic line would be in the human line. Where the tall whites come into the intersection of, and now I'm going to jump back to December 1999 and the DIA guy who had the a long, long uh, discussion with me about his studying conflicting extraterrestrial civilizations fighting each other over our planet Earth and said that our government, the United States, had proof, he used that word, had proof that the three extraterrestrial civilizations had been in conflict over Earth for 270 million years at least. Would those three, which he, he may put them into the category of reptilian, of grays and of humanoids. So now, if you go back 270 million years, what would be the relationship of the current whites on the uh, 82G Eridani solar system? And what would be the relationship to the Nordics which are in Procyon A and B, Sirius A and B, the Pleiades and so forth. And you get to what must be a huge field. Our government probably has an entire department doing the work secretly. What is the genetic, the, the, the direct genetic relationship between Cro-Magnon, Homo sapiens sapien, this current model that has only been on Earth as this current model for the 40, for 45,000 years, going back to the crossfade with Neanderthalensis. Neanderthalensis would be another genetic model that was made from, uh, as that briefing paper I saw here at Kirtland said, these extraterrestrial biological entities have manipulated DNA in already evolving primates to create Homo sapien, or Homo sapien sapien, depending upon which model that you are dealing with. The tall whites, the Nordics, the reptilians, the greys, on and on, have some probably genetic vested interest in this planet. Now we're at a new crossroads where Humans, since 1972, have been going out with tall whites and the Nordics out into other solar systems secretly. They haven't announced this on the Earth publicly. But there are uh, military people, aerospace people, doctors who have talked to me about this. And that means that the tall whites and the Nordics have been interacting at least with our humanity, our space program, and, and before, 
for some time. But that doesn't mean that we have the whole picture of how many other species have interacted with evolving life on Earth that has come in epochs and eons with tremendous extinction events. And out of the extinction events on our planet have come a new flourishing of new life forms. And it seems that part of where we are now, how much of our future in the 21st century will be more upended by natural evolving and cyclic events such as the solar nova, an agitated earth that may be becoming more unstable as it does cyclically, or is the, big, the biggest event going to be that finally, perhaps in the next 10 years, we will have the public introduction of tall whites and Nordics to the world. And as uh, some people have said, is it really going to take 10 years to do a public introduction? And that is a number that Buddy also got, that by 2035 to 2036, he sees that there will be some kind of a landing and it will be public and it will be an introduction and it will be all around the world in uh, digital. It doesn't seem possible that it would take another decade to get to that point. But uh, in the process of where we are now, I'm going to keep trying to report with, to you as much as I can in terms of learning what I think is solid, that the tall whites and the Nordics are truly trying to help us at a time where there could be existential events coming from both human military as well as natural events, and that that is good news, and that the more we learn, perhaps the stronger we will feel psychologically about this evolution that we are now going into, which is we're not alone in this universe, we never have been, and that we are babies our technology and our abilities are in a childhood compared to the tall whites and the tronoloids and the Nordics and to who knows how many others. But as Buddy said, I find this exciting that the time could be so exciting for us to be learning from those that are already advanced and working with entangled particles to have instant communication between bases. Wow, if, if we can just get through this seemingly difficult political part of this century into one where humanity is pulling for humanity with the help of tall whites and Nordics, we could enter perhaps a space age that could be exciting and not threatening. That's my prayer. Ian, another question? Uh, Linda, um, I was just going to do the super chats. So thank you very much to our audience yeah. for the general, su general super chats this evening. There's quite a few of them. I've just had to turn the page. So here we go. Moonbird. Hi. Laurie <laughs> Peter Tabers. Caroline Barnett. Deandra Dunn. Jerry Tobias. Patricia Tempest, Isabella Pacetti Perkins, Jay Lightwalker, Courtney C, Empress I, Louis Cringera, Empress Inaui, I, I can't say the second word, I can't, can't, see, can't read my own writing, Academic Aunt, Stella Lush, K. Al Means, Stacy Lupto, Caroline Boyce, Jerine Broker, Linda Emeterio, Vinnie K. Blue, wow. Kathy Iwanski, Jus Zod, Wizza A. Thank you. Wow, you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I am so glad. I feel that you are supporting the work that I am trying to do, even though 
a lot of days it feels like I am trying to swim upstream against currents that do not want the truthful information to be out in the world, and I think it should be. As Buddy said, and following what I have said, it is an abuse uh, to our species to not know the whole truth. And so thank you very much. And thank you to all of the people who have been in our audience and continue to come from so many other parts of the world. That means everything because I feel this should be a global movement on the part of humanity to want to know the whole truth of our relationship to these other intelligences who are either neutral, friendly, or hostile, and not be afraid. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and Linda, on the uh, locations, we've had Puerto Rico check in now and also South Africa. And I also want to say, wherever anyone is in the world tonight, they're going to be experiencing the February full moon, which is the First Nation peoples call the yes. snow moon or the yes. hunger moon or the bone moon tonight. Yes, yes. Beautiful full moon tonight. Go ahead. Okay. Pamela uh, Jay has just uh, written in to say the tall whites that she witnessed were in perfect shape, but their bodies were chalky white. Yes, that is uh, a common description. It has been said to me, look, they're that white. The, the color of a white copy sheet. And that's where some people have said that in seeing them, you know that you're not anywhere near humanity. If, if I were that white, uh, we would think that, that something was really wrong. So we are kind of pinkish, beigeish, beigeish, brownish, brownish, uh, it, all of the shades. And theirs is this color. So right there might be a reason why we, we don't see them or they don't interact with us yet because they have not been formally introduced. Uh, they're definitely working with the government and aerospace and a lot of places. But it may be because they are supposed to be so brilliant at every level that maybe it is true that they're working, they're helping us uh, in so many facets, but that they wait for the actual political public introduction when they know that all of humanity has had enough information that, the, that like a show like this, and we'll do others, is in a way introducing them so that when they finally showed up in whatever craft they chose to first appear with, that it wouldn't be fright, it wouldn't be scary, it would be, I want to see your ship. <laughs> it would be, I want to know, like all of us, uh, a hum human we, we want to know so much more. And that would be healthy if that was the state of curiosity of humanity to the tall whites and the Nordics and maybe even the grays. But I think that it's becoming so clear that the grays are mostly artificial intelligence and they are working for something, but it is not in the context of what the tall whites and the Nordics are trying to do. So that makes it even more interesting and fascinating and possibly leaves questions of uh, what are the dangers? What are the upsides of our working as humans with tall whites, Nordics, maybe grays, uh, and others that we don't have a lot of details about, but that we would feel some kind of life brothership with other beings that are trying to help us. And that, that might slow down anything coming from the Tronoloids or other civilizations that might just be expanding their populations, but we don't want them expanding here. And it seems like in a way that where we are on the earth now with the problems of humanity learning to live with humanity 
on a planet that is facing a lot of turbulence environmentally, the same thing would be happening on other planets and that this is, it's going to go from the, the sight of Earth to our learning about our, our interstellar neighborhood and continuing because if there are three trillion galaxies in this universe, we're just scratching a teeny line in the surface, which I find amazing. Oh my God, to know about all of the sections of the universe and could black holes somehow be the holographic projectors of this universe, which is brand new opening up in uh, science news today. I find it just fascinating, stimulating, energizing, no matter what. So what else have we got? Here's a great question, Linda. If we were to become acquainted with the ETs, what is the relationship we should expect? Obviously, they are may, way more advanced in technology, but perhaps not in other ways. We know they have had wars amongst themselves. Technology can hinder, stifle emotional and psychological growth. Is the relationship we should expect going to be like creator, sub-life, adult child, father child, kings, court, slave, captor, hostage, scientist, love, blood, or equals? I think that all of those have been the situation on Earth up till now. And my feeling is from what I have been learning from several sources about the Nordics and the tall whites, if they wanted a dominant position on Earth, they could have had it easily. And it seems instead that what we are seeing demonstrated are beings that are willing to try to help and as Buddy has remote viewed and seen several times, the tall whites have interjected they have really, really helped us, but we don't know that they have made sure that X would not happen and Y would not happen because they see the dominoes falling. That's one of the things that's been stressed. They understand the way the universe works at such a profound, deep, interstitial level that they can have predictions in time that go forward, backward, uh, that what they see, what they would say to us, if you go this way or this way, we will show you what will happen. And that if we're on a 4.6 billion year planet and it's a 13.8 billion universe as we've described and discussed before, if these beings are, let's say, just pick a number, let's say that they come from an evolutionary root that was a billion years older, then their relationship to the universe, their relationship to understanding how to move in time tunnels, their understanding of how to entangle particles, to use then uh, what would be artificial intelligence, to get those particles to places where they want bases, places where they mine, places where they have all kinds of things that each planet, each solar system would provide something. And that they have to get out the entangled particles first, doing it with AI, and then they establish their instant communication with what would be large um, supports both in goods and minerals and a whole lot of things. They would have a whole support system in different solar systems. And that they're able to do that and, can, and are doing it at such a high level. And we're babies and we're learning. Okay, so the high tall whites, which are described by everybody I've ever talked to have had interaction with them, they may be strict but that they are very moral, that they care about truth, that they actually would seem to me to be beings that we could learn a lot from. 
And maybe the tall whites and the Nordics, they don't want to babysit, but they do want to see this humanity that is someone's first original. It started with evolving in Homo erectus, and now we are a mix of advanced ETs and an evolution of primate on Earth. And that's what Homo sapiens sapien is. Well, those beings who know every single thing about the genetic experimentation on Earth, the ones that have based themselves in Ganymede for relaxation and study and whatever they're doing there, um, that if we go from this solar system to, say, uh, Proxima Centauri or to the Trappist, uh, the incredible Trappist planet system that seems to have two planets very similar to Earth, that all of that together, it seems to me that our relationship, when it's finally a public introduction, all humanity, all human leaders, and maybe it's done with a very specific time, okay, this is the kind of crap that is going to appear it's going to settle down, uh, and maybe it's a big lighted area, uh, and, th and then the craft does exactly what the humans are introducing, and then uh, there are the beings that are to be introduced we already would have been introduced to in the New York Times and the Washington Post and news that uh, we're now going to meet and there will be this uh, big, big, huge, huge uh, ceremony, and they will uh, have a relationship where it will be introduced. They're not going to rule. Uh, they're not going to take over governments. They, they are not here to claim Earth. No, they are here to do what they have been doing behind the scenes for centuries. And it reminds me, when I was in college, which was from 1960 to uh, 1965 undergraduate and 66 to 68 at Stanford in my master's degree, I remember clearly how, uh, there were, was an encyclopedia of uh, volumes in one of the libraries, and I think it was at the University of Colorado. And... Uh, I was doing something that had to do with the foundation of our country. It was a project I was working on as a student. And that I had opened up a, I don't remember if it was Encyclopedia Britannica or a Book of the World or any of those, but it was like that in the library. And I was reading about Thomas Jefferson because I was interested in him and the context of his life when he wrote uh, the, uh, uh, our Declaration of Independence. That's what I'm reading, and that's why I'm reading it. And it came to a paragraph that said that Thomas Jefferson had written either in a diary or had told somebody in the family, and it had been part of the history of his life, that he was sitting in the garden he was working on the Declaration of Independence very specifically when uh, not very far away was a gate in a fence and that he looked up and saw a dark hooded figure. The hood came over the head. Uh, the cape was all the way to the ground. The dark hooded figure opened up the gate, walked toward Thomas Jefferson, laid down a drawing as he communicated, this shall be the symbol of your nation. And the cloak figure walked out rapidly, and Thomas Jefferson, in this encyclopedia that I was reading, this was the 13-stepped pyramid with the eye in the middle that is on all of our money that that was what was laid down to Thomas Jefferson and that that is what ended up uh, evolving into our history. 
And when I think about that, I think of it as a metaphor for the question, what would be the relationship with uh, the a very, very thousand year in advance of us ETs who do want us to be able to be part of their confederation of cosmic beings and planets and all of that, and that we have to be educated and helped in order to do that. That description that I just told you, I have never been able to find in any later encyclopedias, books, or anything. I remember reading it, taking notes, but it disappeared. It is as if throughout the history of the last, let's say, 40,000 years, that there have been insertions by advanced intelligences, but they've always done it in ways it didn't, it wasn't a dialogue with humans. It was like a help here and there. You could say that since the 1960s that we have had a lot of help probably from the tall whites. Uh, I have been told that they are the ones who made sure that we did not have any more nuclear bombs after World War II. They are the ones who have interacted with our uh, nuclear missile sites and in other parts of the world. That would be help from advanced knowledge, not wanting to take over, not wanting to have us be under their thumb, but their being advanced enough to see where problems were coming, or in this case, to help found a new nation. The voice said, this shall be the symbol of your nation. And the United States of America is an experiment. And we're at a very rocky time where the, the, whole, the whole concept of a democracy as we have been living for nearly 300 years is on shaky ground. But it may be that the inspiration for this experiment of democracy goes directly to the helpful backing of us in, in behind by the tall whites, the Nordics, maybe some greys and others that we don't know much about. And that they're doing that perhaps with a trillion planets at some level. So I think that if the truth is that the tall whites and the tall Nordics have a vested interest in helping any evolving intelligent life to stand on its own two feet, to learn in our case that we have powerful souls. When Buddy remote viewed that aspect that he ran into in his remote viewing, that the tall whites have 700, 800 year lives, but that they are biological, like we are biological. And you've heard me uh, take my note that I wrote two or three years ago saying about this universe, the whole point of this universe is, is an experiment in organic consciousness. Organic consciousness versus AI. And it may be, as Buddy said, that biological, organic, physical beings, if given the option of a thousand year life, they might find that a biological, organic, thousand-year life might be too long. And then they would choose at some point to leave biology and go into the non-biological, digital life form or some variation on that theme. To me, I think of if if I, as a human biological life form, could have a thousand year life 
and that I could continue for a thousand years exploring everything that I am exploring now and multiply it by a thousand and that I could go to other planets and other suns and always be reporting back to Earth to be a universe reporter. I think that a thousand years, 10,000 years, but, but the, the kicker is you would have to have your body and your mind and your energy stay at no more than 26 years old even if you had a thousand revolutions around the sun you would want that that the power and energy of a young body and mind that never tired that never gave up that always kept going and to me then you you could live for a thousand years easily I, it just seems to me because i love i love life i love learning and there's nothing I am more excited about than trying to learn more about the intelligences that are there that we on the earth have been denied of official public knowledge about. So I hope tonight, I hope, let me know uh, in the chat, in comments, do you find this deep dive into subjects of which there is evidentiary material, there is the ability to remote view, but we don't have the proof of the craft and the beings publicly in front of us. But do you find that this program tonight excites you and provokes you to want to learn more? I would, I would hope it would, but I would like your honest honest chats and comments because that's what I'm trying to do is as much as I possibly can learn and report why we are, are still living on a planet where the policies of the power brokers are denial. So let me know. Ian? Oh, 838. Yeah. I'm at, the, I'm at the close of this hour. You, you, you're out of time, Linda. You've been doing the overtime. I just wanted to say we were uh, thankful to have Buddy himself in the chat this evening. Oh, I'm so glad. He really is gifted. Okay, are we... I, I, I'm... Yes, thank you, Buddy, everybody who is here. I am uh, so glad that we could do this tonight. I'm looking forward to your feedback. And as one humble homo sapien sapien on dear evolving planet Earth, I give you a hug to the digital world, which is the only way we can so far, and hope that there will be a time when the world is not so dangerous with disease that we can collaborate more in the matter world. But in the meantime, I love you guys everywhere. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. Select a language Bind them anywhere. They love and the captions will now appear in that language. Sort of gone through and they will hold their heads. I never had a cat do that before. And they'll pull against the comb, helping me get out snarls. And I think it's the best they've ever been.